I personally, in terms of the untold, the unwritten, and the hidden history of the working class and oppressed peoples, is a lot of what our party, our party comrades, were involved in over the years in the union movement in both a traditional organizing way and in non-traditional ways and in expanding both the consciousness and really the whole definition of what it's what it is to be a militant, a revolutionary in the union movement. And there are so many examples in our party of things that um, our comrades and as a whole the party took on as a whole that m I'd say most most even current members of the party might be unaware of or might have forgotten. As so much of the history of the party is, in a lot of ways, the struggle history of the party. Um, and we really do need a series of pamphlets that really let people know the tremendous struggles we've been um, helping and as well as leading. And in the labor movement, that is the struggle of the workers as a whole. This is very, we have a very, very rich history. The comrades uh, of Workers World Party went into the union movement or were recruited from the factories or the workplaces and adopted a communist attitude of trade unionism. The most militant, dedicated, self-sacrificing, hardworking in their fight for a contract to get a union in, but always with the knowledge that they would bring to the workers and to every struggle and that is because they had a grounding in the relationship, the irreconcilable character of the struggle between the capitalist class and the working class, and of looking around and seeing that struggle at a moment in time and assessing it, assessing the relations between the classes, assessing all the classes in society, assessing its relationship to the communities and so on. And of never falling into the idea that, as many have, many terrific people who over the years started out, and I know many of them, um, started out like I did, in the early 70s doing union work, who then became staff and so on like that, who lost the idea that they had, some of them had had previously, that we are in this irreconcilable struggle. That basically, no matter how great the contract, we negotiate. It's temporary based on the relationship of class forces and it never changes their basic relationship between the classes. That workers are exploited and that the bosses do the exploiting and they make all their profits based on them stealing the unpaid labor of the workers. And that we don't need them. We don't need them at all to organize any form of production to organize society, they are a parasitic element standing in the way of the needs of the people. Many other unionists, well, they came to the point, well, look, what's good for the company ultimately will be good for the workers. And all we're asking for is a fair contract. Early on, you would learn in Workers' World, we never use the expression that this is a fair contract. We might say, we based on the struggle, we got a better contract. But we never said this is a fair contract because the relationship of the workers being exploited under capitalism is never fair, no matter what you get, because you're still being exploited. So with this fundamental, and a fundamental of internationalism, the fundamentals of knowing that there's no struggle that takes place, including in the union movement, 
that stands apart from what's going on in society, that you might want to ignore the fact that there's imperialist wars going on, but it affects you. You might want to say, oh, I'm just going to get a contract and I'm going to get this and so on, but then you're dealing with the issues, all of the social issues that come into play in the union movement. There are some struggles, just as a beginning, because, I mean, there's so many that our party was involved in, but I just want to bring out some that I felt um, may not be known or may have been forgotten about, in which our party played a very, and there's so many, as, there were so many struggles that are almost now taken for granted that you would never know that they first came out of workers' world. The idea of pre-notifying workers that you had to give time to pre-notify workers if there was going to be a layoff. That was something that we proposed. Now, it sounds kind of not that big a deal, but you have to realize that bosses fought this tooth and nail. They said, it's our factories. We own it. It's our private property. You can't tell us when we're going to close a factory down or not. And our idea of raising the demand for pre-notification was to give the workers time to organize against the planned closings. Not just to be told, oh, you have 60 days or 90 days and you're out. It was to challenge the idea that property rights prevailed and give workers time to organize against it, even to occupy a plant if necessary. But now it's, oh, it's okay, it's part of, it's federal law, pre-notification. Or things like pregnancy disability for workers, which Comrade Sue Steinman spearheaded in New York City, was the first state in the country to have it. And now it's, it's pretty much seen everywhere, but it took a very big struggle against the idea, <laughs> fighting for the rights of women uh, workers or women who want to become workers, whether they were union or not. You, you, there's so many that are, go beyond the union s traditional situation and where we were always looking to fight for class unity by fighting racism, by fighting sexual oppression of any kind, and where we were always looking to give the workers a way to, to put their right to their job, their property right, their overall right to everything, but to find a way to do it so they could take steps to challenge the right of the bosses who proclaimed that they had the right over everything, and do now as well. And it, this challenge is even greater now with high technology making um, the struggle much more difficult rather than a time of expansion of industry, both industrial and service.